So about three and a half years ago, I was in Monrovia, Liberia, and I had, had went there mostly because I didn't, want, didn't know what to do with my life. I wanted to have an impact. And I found myself sitting at an internet cafe in a place called Royal Hotel. And, and I went there to help some kids get off the street and into school. And it's one of those things in life that it sounds good when you tell your friends about it. It looks good on your resume. But the truth about my experience in Liberia, about 3,000 miles away from here, is I wasn't really having an impact. I, I wasn't changing things. It was small. It was incremental. Again, it sounded good, but it wasn't really changing things in a transformative way. So I got frustrated came back to the United States and decided that I wanted system change, not incremental change. That I wanted to attack a big system out there. Maybe education, maybe healthcare, maybe energy, and maybe food, but I wanted to attack a big system with a big question. And this question began obsessing me. What would it look like if we just started over. And I asked it about education and energy, and you can ask it about campaign finance reform, but I decided to ask it about food. A system that, when you just lay it on its side, is archaic, is inefficient, and if we were going to start it all over again, man, we probably wouldn't do it like we do it today. So I decided to dig into it a little bit more, and this is what I found. I found that the current state of the world's food system is really defined by the stuff here on the left. Let's just call it the wrong thing. You got lots of food out there that tastes pretty good, that's awfully affordable, but is shitty for the body and is shitty for the planet. And you eat it, I eat it, my dad eats it, my mom eats it, the world eats it, not because we're all bad people. We eat it for the same reason that coal-fired energy powers most of the buildings in a city that almost universally agrees that climate change is accepted scientific fact. It's in the system. And system problems are really hard problems because it doesn't mean that people are bad. It means the system is constructed to make it very easy for all of us to violate our deepest values. We go on eating this way, but the more I dug into this system, the more I got frustrated because it seemed like the alternative to this system of bad food was weak. And let's call it the right thing. The right thing really began to frustrate me because the right thing is about saying the way you beat back the wrong thing, the way you beat back the negative system, is you have lots of really expensive food for wealthy people, and often it doesn't even taste that good. And this food, you might eat it. Some of my wealthy friends in San Francisco might eat it. But I'm telling you, it does not actually solve the problem. It's a fantasy that it solves the problem. It makes us feel good to talk about it. It makes us feel good to think that a world of conscious consumers are going to adopt a better path. But the more that I dug into it, the more that I remembered my friends in Birmingham, Alabama, the more that I reflected on my time in Africa, the more that I got my head out of San Francisco and got back to Beijing and Birmingham, the more I realized that you're not going to create a better food system with the right thing on the right. The only way you create a better food system is making the good thing so damn good, so delicious, so inexpensive, that even if you don't give a damn, you still choose it. That's creating a better system. In the same way, if some of my conservative friends who don't believe in the science of climate change and don't really believe in much about solar energy or wind energy, just flip the switch and there you go. Make it so easy, make it taste so great, make it so accessible in every single solitary way that you cannot help but choose it. If I was really serious about answering the question, what would it look like if we just started over? I think we would create a system that looked like that. Now, that system, unfortunately, can't be, recreated, can't be created by the ridiculous supply chain that we have today. Can't be created by a supply chain that's addicted to lots of soy and lots of corn 
can't be created by a, by a supply chain that is dominated by the biggest food co companies that are really interested in incremental change. Sometimes create a different system, you need to start from scratch. And that's what we've attempted to do at Hampton Creek. And the insight that enables us to start from scratch is based upon 400,000 plant species out there, 92% of which have never been explored for how they can make your food better. So step back and think about that. This world, because of lots of reasons, because of a farm bill, because of farm subsidies, because of habits, because of ways of thinking, forgot that there are all sorts of different plants out there that can make all sorts of different food a lot better. They can make pancakes better, they can make bread better, they can make scrambled eggs better, they can make sauces and dressings better, uh, they can make all sorts of products that you've never even heard of better. When I say better, I mean use less water, use less land, taste better, actually meet the needs of the system that can really enable a world to thrive. So what we've done is actually explore them. And I'm gonna take you a little bit into the science and then I'll, I'll get back to the larger vision. But the Canadian yellow pea is just one of 400,000 species. It's not the best, it's not the only one, but it's one of them. So what our team of computational biologists, of biochemists, of food scientists, of molecular biologists does, is they look at species like the Canadian yellow pea and they run experiments or assays to get to the molecular properties of the varietals in that species. So all those columns are varietals or subtypes of one species of Canadian yellow pea. And what's interesting when you run experiments, you see that the molecular properties, whether the molecular weight or surface protein hydrophobicity or solubility, they're actually different within the species. So one species could have a molecular weight of X, excuse me, one varietal of the, of the species could have a molecular weight of X, and another varietal within that same species could have a different molecular weight. Now that doesn't really matter that much, except when you dig into it and you realize that what happens on a molecular level actually matters on a functional level. And I'll, I'll use this moment to, to step back to talk about the functionality of food a little bit because it's not very romantic, it's, there's not a lot of story to it, but it is the way it is. Whether you're having mayonnaise or that, that awesome veggie burger outside or what of the, the amazing uh, magic that Andres is cooking up. Food is functionality. It's aeration, it's gelation, it's browning, it's preservation, uh, it's emulsification. And we've been able to identify a whole lot of plants that have certain functions that enable us to build better food products. This is one example. We identified this molecular property, surface protein hydrophobicity, then when it's above a particular threshold, actually emulsifies. It enables us to build products that typically would require some ingredients that maybe aren't the best for the environment or health, and instead use others that are, like the yellow split pea. Now, when you got all this data, you can actually model it. And you can use all that data to help you find other species that have other molecular properties that are correlated to other functionalities. This is a plant. We threw it in a pan and it scrambles like a chicken egg. And then when you step back, you realize and if you're really serious about asking this question, what would it look like if we started over? There's a massive opportunity out there because we forgot about these 90, we forgot about these hundreds of thousands of plants that we can think differently about a whole range of different food products. Baked goods and salt and scrambled eggs and dressings. And just in the lab, we decided to fool around a little bit and we made protein snacks that are rich in micronutrients. I spent some time in Ethiopia and I vividly remember uh, young people with these awful things called goiters on the side of their neck because they were micronutrient deficient. What would it look like we created protein snacks that were made with a hyper-affordable source of protein? What would it look like if we started over in pasta? Maybe it would last longer. Maybe it would use less water. Maybe it would taste better. And all these things don't have to start over with synthetic engineering either because we don't screw with the plants. We don't splash chemicals on the plants. They're, in fact, all non-GMO. Ice cream, what would it look like we started over? I don't know, it would use less land, use less water. Maybe it tastes better. Maybe it lasts longer. Maybe it has sources of protein that are better for the body. Or custards, or I told you about that plant that we found. Here's a quick clip, clip of what it looks like when we throw it in the pan.
they're close. No wonder you're so excited. I mean, this is so hard. I mean, this is this is the hardest thing. No doubt. No yeah, doubt. This is definitely the hardest thing. Yeah, you're close. I, I have I've had the privilege of seeing a lot of things in, in my lifetime as a culinarian and in the last 10 years making television. What I've seen today is, is earth changing. I'll step back and, and ask the question and answer it with me. What would it look like if we started over in the food? That little cup doesn't just have to have our logo on it. If you're interested in starting a food company, it could have yours too. And think about starting over. What does it mean to make the good thing, meaning the thing that is strengthening instead of degrading to the environment, the thing that is strengthening to the body instead of crappy for the body? What does it mean to make that thing taste better and be more affordable, knowing that it is a fantasy good food for the world unless we cannot meet those two objectives. Good food does not win when it wins with you, I promise you. It only wins when it's a system change. And if we step back and we imagine reinventing food, we can imagine the good thing being 83% more cost effective. 80 plus percent of people preferring it. Maybe good food doesn't even require refrigeration. I don't know, I just threw that one up there. But you can really unleash your brain and imagine if we can focus on what we want using a different approach, what does that actually look like? And how could that change things in a fundamental way, knowing that conscious consumerism isn't always gonna save the world? Now, we were doing all this research for two plus years and I was really anxious to get out there. I'm not a scientist. Um, I went to law school, uh, studied sociology and government. We're lucky enough to hire some incredible people to do the research. But I wanted to get out there. I actually wanted to have the impact that I wasn't having, unfortunately, in Africa. I wanted to take this approach of starting over, make real food products around it, and then see if we could get the biggest food companies in the world, the biggest retailers in the world, the Walmarts, the Targets, the Compass Groups, the biggest food service company in the world based here in the UK, if we could get them to buy into this idea of starting over. And the thing just blew up. Uh, and this is just in the last year and a half. Uh, our partners today include everyone from the largest convenience store chain in the world, our friends at 7-Eleven, to Compass Group, the biggest food service company in the world, to Walmart, the biggest retail in the world, to Costco, to places that you might expect us to be, Whole Foods and natural channel grocery stores, to places that people look at me kind of cockeyed when they see, like Dollar Tree. And I'll just pause for a second on Dollar Tree, because out of all the places that we are today, it might be the place that I'm the most proud of being. Because our philosophy, which guides everything that we do, the philosophy of the good thing, the thing that's better for our body, that's better for the planet, must be less expensive and must taste better, must be accessible to people who are even living on welfare. The fact that we're there to me is a slight manifestation of why we started this damn thing in the first place. Another great example is our work with Compass Group, the biggest food service company in the world. Two of the biggest trap doors for us from a communication perspective. One, all this techno food that people don't want, right? We gotta be careful about that. I know we're at a Wired conference right now, but the truth is you don't solve the biggest problems in food if you turn people off in that way. And we gotta all be careful about that because you wanna say the truth of what it is, but it's a communication issue. The second big trap door for us is being framed as an alternative. That's a nice little product for those vegans out there in Northern California and London who care about that stuff. That's a recipe for creating a really small company and a very limited amount of impact. But Compass Group, the biggest food service company in the world, has actually removed some of the largest incumbents from their menu like our friends at Unilever, and like our friends at a company called Continental Mills, and said, I want Hampton Creek's products to replace them, not be an alternative to them, but replace them entirely. 
And all of this progress that we've made in a short period of time has given us what I care about the most, and that's impact. Remember my frustration in that hotel, Royal Hotel in Monrovia, Liberia, there wasn't real impact. And the impact of a changing food system can be felt in the water that we saved. Just this year, we saved over 1.5 billion gallons of water. The carbon emissions, the land, the sodium, the cholesterol taken out of a system, all by asking the question, what would it look like if we started over and trying to build something to actually meet the demands of that question? I think the biggest thing that we've learned is that. And, you know, I want to encourage you all, when you're thinking about what you're going to do, whether you're at a company, uh, whether you're thinking about the next thing that you're going to start, there is a world of, honestly, bullshit that you can go after. Companies that you can create that have limited impact, that might look good to your friends, that might feel good for a second, that might even allow you to raise some venture capital but we've got too many damn problems in the world for you to focus on things that don't matter. So I'm gonna encourage you to ask big questions about things that actually matter, about the needs that we're facing in the world. And I wanna close with this. We decided as a company, Hampton Creek, to actually go back to Monrovia, uh, to go back to, to an area next to that hotel that I first felt that really deep frustration and partner with an organization called More Than Me to ask this question again, but ask it in terms of a different system, education. And we just started partnering with the, the school to, to help these young girls who have been victims of all sorts of awful things, to give them the skills of entrepreneurship that they already have, and see if bringing some of our food and ways of thinking about food can help them start their own businesses, and start over uh, in their own lives. So with that, thank you for, for listening, um, and I really appreciate, David, you giving me the time to, to share it with everyone. Thank you. Trouble is, Josh, when you're taking on some big vested interests, there are powerful bits of the food industry that decide they want to get in your way. Yeah. And you've had a few experiences lately. Um, there was a freedom of information request that led to some emails from particularly the Egg Council blocking you from getting into the big stores, talking about, I think the phrase they used was, should we take a hit on him? Yeah. <laughs> Pretty embarrassing for them when these emails surface. But what's your response when you see evidence that powerful elements of the food industry are working together? to try and stand in your way? Uh, I think a couple things. One is, um, I think it says that we're doing something right, and that feels good. Uh, the second is to, to step back and, and realize that we've created both a set of partners in the entrenched food system, right? The biggest food service company, the biggest retailer, the third biggest retailer, but you know, with that, Everyone, everyone, you know, can't can't be happy about it. So I think more than anything, it's it's uh, it's validating, but it, it encourages us, I think, to get to work and do things a lot faster. And we just we decided when it came to the American Egg Board stuff, actually to to go to the USDA, which is an agency of the U.S. government that actually should su should support a lot of the things I, I heard uh, the previous speakers talking about and basically say, WTF, like, what are you doing? Why are you supporting these things? You know, you gotta support better food for people, accessible food for people. Um, we don't need American taxpayer dollars going to blocking, you know, what, what is something that we think is part of the solution. But there are still some powerful food lobbies and indeed regulators that are standing in your way. You served some just mayo non-dairy mayonnaise in the networking area. Yep. Um, the FDA, the food regulator, has told you you're not allowed to call it mayo because it mayonnaise. doesn't have, well, Ma I think you have to change the name from just mayo, don't you? Well, yes, yeah, so, the, so the FDA um, sent us a letter um, and said that uh, mayonnaise is the current standard of identity and that requires the use of an egg yolk containing ingredient. Um, we've decided not to put an egg yolk containing ingredient in our mayo. 
um, in part because uh, water and, and carbon and other things like that. Uh, so the next step for us is to actually meet with the FDA, which we're doing in the next few weeks, uh, share with them our, our vision of food. And my hope for it is less about you know, keeping the name, although I'm pretty optimistic that we're going to keep the name, and more about sharing with the FDA that if we don't figure out a way to integrate sustainability into food standards that were written, written 40 plus years ago, it's going to be really difficult for us to build a better food system. Uh, so we'll see how it goes. Um, I'm, I'm optimistic about it, but you never know. Good luck with the fight. Josh Tetris. Thanks, my friend.